I will welcome everybody to our professional practices uh, here in December. This is our last one of the semester. And so we're so glad that you took some time today. Um, we're really excited that Dr. Benjamin Ahn is going to be speaking with us. I got the privilege of meeting him earlier this semester for the first time. And he's doing a lot of important work on making sure that we're creating instruments that help us um, be sure to get the right data for the information that we wanna share with others. And so he's been helping our innovation fellows program to make sure that we're capturing the right data that we can share with, um, we have you know a lot of people who are interested in what's happening in this building. Um, a lot of people don't even know that this building is for every cyclone. And that means every major, every department, whether you're an undergrad, whether you are in high school looking to come to Iowa State, all the way up to alumni and corporate sponsors. Um, so that's really exciting, but how do we make sure we're sharing the right information and gathering it the right way. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg for what Dr. Ahn is going to be talking to us about today. I've also um, invited Dr. Mani Mina. He was our professional practices speaker right before Thanksgiving, our November professional practices speaker. Um, and his was so wonderful. I had such a great time listening in. Um, the title of that one was E is for empathy and engineering. Um, so uh, he did such a good job that I asked him to come help us moderate this one as well. He knows Dr. Ahn. And so I'm going to encourage you, if you have questions during this, you can throw them into the chat and I will step in. And um, of course, if you want to ask them directly, then I'll make sure that there's time for that or else I'll just read them. Um, but yeah, this is op an opportunity for Dr. Ahn to speak on his innovation here. And then it's also a great opportunity for you to engage um, if that's what you would like to do near the end. So um, if there are any questions for him, for any of us, please put it in the chat. And I'm going to let you all take it from here. Dr. Mina, if you would like to introduce yourself and then introduce Dr. Ahn and then Dr. Ahn, you can take it from there. Thank you. Thank you. It's a privilege uh, to see everybody and a great privilege to see Professor Ahn, whose work is distinguished for me. I know the person uh, the, the his major professor, and also he has amazing work, and I have them here, like engineering innovation. -ness. That's a great work by another colleague of both Professor Ahn and I. His work on innovation, on looking at issues of education, engineering education, and innovation have been amazing. I always benefit from working with him, and it is my personal you know, privilege and honor to be here. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Mani, and thank you, Kimberly, and thanks, Karen, for uh, for inviting me to speak to the group. Uh, it's, yeah, likewise, it's very honor to be here. Um, so I, I understand that Mani presented before me <laughs> and, and uh, that's a very high bar to follow. So if I can follow that, I mean, I mean, even, even half of it, I'll be very, very, uh, satisfied. So yeah, so let me um, first of all share a screen. Um, so I'd like to um, have a kind of a presentation slide here um, to kind of help me go through my presentation. So can everyone see that? Yeah. Let me see. Let me, let me see. Okay. Um, okay. So let me see if I can just a moment. Let me. And we will post this um, in our professional practices site. So uh, for those of you who need to refer back to it, you will have it. Okay, so yeah, so I wanna just take a moment to speak with you uh, about uh, particularly on developing an instrument to measuring students' leadership skills uh, and their ability to embrace change and to synthesize multiple perspectives. Uh, and so here, here's kind of the, kind of the um, thing that I wanna say upfront. So, when I was asked to um, participate in this uh, professional practice forum, I think um, Karen asked whether if I could present something about ways to measure uh, a, a, an outcome, right? Like an innovation outcome or creativity outcome. Uh, and, and if you think about it, there's a multiple ways that we can actually measure outcomes. We can use a survey, we can use an interview, we can do a real-time observation of person who is doing innovation, uh, or, or we can actually assess the actual outcome of the innovation to understand how well the, the, the person, the people have, have innovated. Um, but the, what I wanna kind of focus on today's presentation is on ways to actually create an instrument uh, that can help us measure these outcomes. Uh, 
So here, what I want to focus on is at the moment, I'm focusing on the measuring the outcome of a professional skills like leadership and ability to change and ability to synthesize. But what I share here in terms of developing this instrument, I feel like that you can replicate or take a similar approach to creating an instrument that's capable of measuring some form of innovation, the innovation of an outcome that you are interested in your in your uh, research setting or in your work setting. So, so I want to just take a moment here just to talk about this creation of an instrument process with the context of a professional skill. But again, that professional skill context can be switched as just as easily to an innovation if you'd like to. So with that said, let me let me go through here. So as I mentioned, I'm I'm interested in in the case in the case of professional skills such as leadership uh, in engineering education, uh, and and that's in, that's important because according to ABET, uh, the, the you know we need to develop engineering students' leadership skills. They need to be able to work in teams. They they need to be able to communicate, uh, and you know they need to be able to understand multiple perspectives, for example. There's also a lot of talk about educational policy reports out there that reports this critical aspect of developing students' professional skills. But then the question is, how do we go about developing students' leadership skills, professional skills uh, in engineering classroom setting? Well, I feel like there's definitely three pieces that we need to look into, the content, the assessment, and pedagogy. Again, I want to just emphasize my context here is on professional skills and leadership. But again, you can interchangeably use that professional skill to an innovation if you like to. So again, coming back to these three pieces, we need content, assessment, and pedagogy, sometimes called CAP. And in terms of content-wise, we first need to be able to define leadership or professional skills or innovation for that matter, right? We need to understand what it is, and that would develop the the backbone of the content itself. In addition to having the content, we also need to have an assessment, right? A, a piece of an assessment that we can use to measure whether students have developed their professional skills, their leadership skills, or have enhanced their innovation skills, right? So assessment is kind of the tool, right? And of course, the pedagogy, which of course is related to kind of the teaching practice aspect of it, right? Teaching of innovation, teaching of professional skills. But here, this talk is of course focused on the assessment piece itself. And one of the ways to create an instrument that's able to assess a person's leadership skills. So again, I wanna kind of walk through here the process that I would take potentially to create an instrument. So the first thing that you wanna um, do is to actually able to operationalize the definition of leadership change and synthesis or the operational definition of innovation. Like what, it, what does it mean? So that would be the content part, right? Uh, and then from there, you want to construct a some sort of instrument that's able to measure whatever the outcome that you want to measure. That's the assessment piece. And then finally, develop and implement, implement a survey instrument to students or to whoever your participant group is. So I will talk a little bit more about this, but in order to create an instrument, I divided my work into two phases. The first phase is a qualitative study. And then the second phase is a quantitative study. So in the, in the case of qualitative study, I wanna first find out again, what this content is, right? What is the what is definition of, of leadership and how do I go about operationalizing it, right? And so the question, the research question that we like to use, it's like, what do engineering experts, those who are in the field think about you know, leadership change and then abilities. What do they think it is? What, what, what do they, when they want to see this sort of abilities, what do they measure? What do they need to see from the people that, that perform these leadership skills? So that's, and, and, and I call it qualitative study because the data that we'll be looking at and analyzing is based on interview. And I'll talk more about that. And then the idea is then to transfer the findings from the qualitative study into a quantitative study. So that would be really that connection of building an instrument, okay? Again, here, I talk about outcomes. Again, the outcome can be interchangeable with you know, innovations or whatever, whatever you're interested in as a dependent variable. So here's kind of a quick overview of, of, of what we're talking about here. So there's this qualitative study 
which I want to find out the content of that professional skill from those who know what that is, right? What leadership is, for example. And then I'm going to use some qualitative analysis, like a data analysis that's written there, which indicated as constant competitive method, but there's a lot, a lot of other analytical methods you can use, but I'll be using a certain method to analyze the data that I obtained from the professionals. Those qualitative data would then turn into a constructs uh, and those constructs would then be developed into a individual items, which would then form the backbone of the survey. And then we'll do some uh, cleaning uh, and, and, and construction of the survey items, these items uh, to create a final instrument that hopefully we'll be able to use uh, for measuring certain outcomes. Okay, so in terms of the data collection, um, we have to, in my case, I decided to do a semi-structured interview, at least for this study I did. Um, I selected this approach because as an interview, and, you're able- And you have a question in the chat before you move forward. Okay. Um, are you okay for that? Yeah, that's fine. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, um, Neil, can you ask your question? Sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, Benjamin, I was just wondering if you could expand somewhat on what you mean by change, uh, yeah. particularly as it applies to innovation and, and what are some of your thoughts on how you intend to measure it? Yeah, so, so I actually was planning to get to that a bit later, but- Okay, that's the, fine. The, the, yeah, but I can, I can just quickly mention it here. So the thing that I'm looking at here in terms of change is as, a, as an engineering student, right? As they go out in the field, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of change that's going to be associated, right? The change due to uh, like uh, organizational change, for example. Uh, there's going to be change uh, that's going to occur due to management, for example. So here, what I'm looking at is what are, how, how are they adapting? Or how, what are their abilities to adapt to these changes? How well do they adapt to these changes that occur, uh, both in you know, what, whatever the changes that may occur right, within the um, organization, within, within the society, or, or what have you? So here, let me, let me uh, I'll, I'll elaborate more on that, but that change is one of the main um, professional skill that I'm looking at here. Uh, and then you will see some examples of those, uh, what, what that change will entail. So hopefully hopefully that, that will make sense as we get closer to that section. Uh, and if not, let me know, I can, I can further elaborate on it. So yeah, that's a good question. So here I talk loosely about professional skills, but th there are three things that I'm looking at. I'm looking at um, students' ability as a leader, uh, students' ability to um, understand and manage change uh, and then students' ability to synthesize, uh, you know, both business, um, ethical issues, um, societal matters, uh, and, 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 and those, those matters at hand. So those are the three things that I'm looking at. So, so just coming back to here with this um, slide. So the way in order for me to understand what does this sort of entail, right? What, what does leadership entail? What does, what does change entail? What does synthesis entail? I mean, as a, as a researcher, I want to know what that means, right? So, so I would use a semi-structured interviews where I would actually reach out to a particular group of people who have experience, who have, have had experience in the field, uh, who can talk to me about the sort of three main ideas that I'm looking at in, in the professional skill setting. So, you know, I would have a particular kind of a sampling criteria, um, particularly in this study, I looked at those who worked in academia, as well as those who worked in industry uh, and having that sort of criteria and they had to have some sort of engineering disciplines and have had led some engineering teams. Uh, and, and, you know, I'll kind of recruit a diverse group of people uh, with a range of uh, background experiences, gender, ethnicity, right? So that I can, I can get this sort of kind of general understanding of what these three, three main things that I'm interested in means to them, uh, to, these, to these engineers. So I'll do that through their interview, right? Uh, and then, let's see. And then, so here are kind of the kind of the interview questions that, again, this is not a exhaustive interview questions that I that I've asked the participants. But here's an examples of the questions that you could potentially, um, you know, kind of you know ask, right? So, for example, let's say I have no idea about what leadership is, right? So in this case, I'm going in with kind of an empty mind, right? 
uh, and I want to know from the people that I interview, how do they define leadership, for example, right? How do they define, so how do I know that, that this individual is showing a leadership skill to them or not? What do they observe? What is it that they need to see from them? Right. So th those are the sort of the things that I want to get to. So in order to get to there, I would ask some of these questions. Right. How would you define leadership as an observable attribute? Can you give an example of a situation where engineer would have to use leadership skills? Right. Specific examples from their context would help me understand how they are defining leadership. Right. So I would have those, you know, I would have their responses along with that, because I've looked at three things, I would also ask them about, you know, how do you define change in an engineering context? How do you think one can assess the ability of an engineer to recognize and manage change? And then, you know, they'll provide their own responses. So again, you know, we have this, in this case, I think we had about uh, 12 um, engineers who were working in industry and we interviewed 11 engineers from academia setting. So, you know, we had these diverse group of people and each of them would respond to these questions, right? And then finally the synthesis as well. You know, do you think an engineer should be able to possess the skills to synthesize engineering business and social perspective, you know, so on and so forth, right? So again, these are the questions that I would ask. And then, you know, I would have a kind of a rich data uh, of, of a transcripts um, so I would record these interviews, right? And then I would then transfer them into a transcript. Uh, and so I would have these sort of rich data in transcripts that I can go back uh, and try to understand how they are defining leadership and how that leadership can be perhaps later observed or measured uh, in students, right? So, so here, I guess what I want you to take away through this is that um, with these interview questions, you want it to be have an open ended type of questions right you don't want to just have a closed end question where they say yes or no, you want you want a specific examples you want a specific context you want a specific details of the people's involved of the stakeholders who are involved. So you want to have sort of open ended question and this is sort of the dialogue that you would have as a person who wants to identify these things. Uh, with, with the interviewer, right? Again, I want to just emphasize, you know, I'm focusing on these three things, but you can easily transfer that into a innovations uh, or innovation constructs, right? Or whatever, whatever you're focusing on. Okay, and then, so here, um, I I'll just quickly go through here, but, you know, these are sort of kind of the analysis procedure that would be involved if you were to analyze an interview transcript. So for those who are kind of in the engineering field, uh, this could be a very uncomfortable situation. Say what, analyzing what interview into what are you doing? Uh, but uh, this is possible. This is you know, a well um, uh, rigorous procedure that um, social science and educational people have used. I've used this approach uh, and I've become a believer in this, in this approach as well. Uh, so, you know, I, you know, so one of the procedures that you could potentially go through is the open coding and constant comparative method where, uh, bear with me, it's a, it's a lot of list, but um, you'd first read all the transcripts, right? You've got, you know, in my case, maybe 23 transcripts, different transcripts, you know, you kind of read through it each and then kind of try to make a note about the important ideas and the memos, you know, that, that comes through from, from those transcripts. Uh, and then you probably want to maybe select, um, you know, maybe two or three transcripts that are most rich in detail um, because you already have read through it, you know which one is the most rich one. Uh, and then from there, number two, you begin to kind of look at each sentences, right? Sentences or words or even paragraphs. Uh, so a particular passage uh, and then begin to generate labels, right? Uh, in terms of, oh, what do they mean here? Like, uh, is there a certain meaning that's coming, coming across in this passage or in this paragraph or in this sentence, for example? Uh, and then once you create label, uh, you then begin to kind of try to determine uh, the relationship between, you know, label one versus label two, you know, can they be organized together? Can they be compiled? Can they be uh, put together or do they need to be separate? Are they independent, you know, individual unique labels or what have you, right? Uh, and then, you know, once you have these multiple labels at, at play, you know, are you able to kind of put them under a larger construct? Is there some common themes or common idea that's flowing across these labels? And can that can can it have a hierarchy construct construct idea under that, right? So you begin to create what I call it the constructs. Uh, and then these constructs would then become part of your kind of a um, sort of the main ideas that that resides which within each of these three things, right? The leadership, the synthesis, and the change idea. 
And then you then use these constructs uh, to perhaps you know, create a code book, what you call a code book uh, to analyze the rest of the interviews. So this, this is actually a kind of a specific research procedure uh, that are commonly used. Uh, and, and this does take a lot of skills, but I wanna kind of share with you how sort of you know, interview transcript that's qualitative in nature uh, can be uh, rigorously analyzed. So then, then if, if somebody wants to um, determine how to do this, can you maybe even following up, identify a source where they would go to, for an example of how to do this? Yeah, so uh, yeah, there's plenty of resources out there uh, and, and Mani knows it, I'm sure too. Uh, you know, one of the most cite, cited um, book is Miles and Huberman. Um, I forget the I, I forget the title of the book, but it's related to open coding procedure. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I'll be more than I mean, if you have questions specifically about the citations okay. about these particular procedures, yeah, please reach out to me and I'll be happy to share some of the resources. So after this procedure, what you have is a, is a, is a construct, right? Based on those 23 interviews. So here's kind of back, coming back to kind of Neil's question. Uh, so here I found all the constructs, right? Related to the leadership. So based on the questions that I've asked, right? Interview questions, the 23 people um, and analyzing those 23 transcripts, I managed to come down into constructs, right? So, I, so the first construct that you see here is motivation. So they say that in order to be effective leader or to show sort of the leadership, you have to be able to inspire people with good relationship to share visions and to energize people to achieve that vision, right? So that is what the construct of that is called motivation. And then I would have a definition of each construct, right? Uh, and then along with that, although I did not put you know, the, the rest of the summary, the, 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 the definitions of each construct, but there's the proactive construct, there's the empowerment construct, there's people skill, there's outcome driven communication, right? So, and so forth. So this is not exhaustive, but you get the idea, right? This is what, when I analyze those interviews, when people talked about leadership, these are the unique constructs that I was able to find from each, uh, from, from my participants. Likewise, um, this is more now gearing to the Neil's question. This was the change construct, right? So in the first kind of construct, you know, they say that in order to be able to um, understand and manage change, you know, you need to be able to kind of work in different areas of competency, right? Refer engineers ability to work on a different kinds of jobs across discipline and across diverse technologies. Uh, and in addition to that, you know, they have to be able to manage change. They have to be flexible. They have to be kind of advanced in technology, understanding, awareness, organizational change, social change, economic change, and what have you. Again, these are just constructs and they would also have it, their own definition uh, stated, but just in the interest of the space-wise, did not put it here, but I just kind of shared with you some of the examples of constructs that were able to be identified. Likewise, the final thing, the synthesis, right? The, again, the holistic thinking, business perspective, so on and so forth, right? So again, you know, you'd have also a construct that's laid out for the synthesis itself. Okay, so we have now kind of the working definition of what leadership change and synthesis is what they are from these professionals, right? Those who have been working in the field uh, and have had experience, uh, you know, dealing with these sort of leadership, uh, these sort of abilities. Again, you can easily refer, change this into innovations if you would like to. And so this is where the fun begins, right? So we're kind of done with our phase one, right? This sort of qualitative work. And now we're moving on to phase two, where we're now developing an instrument, but in order for this instrument, for us, a survey, we need to have an items, right? We need to create these items. So you can see here on the left side, you've got the leadership constructs, the change construct and synthesis construct, which, and, and each of those, you know, constructs that belong to each of these. Uh, and you saw the motivations, people, skill, proactive empowerment, so on and so forth, right? Again, not exhaustive. It. But now the goal for you to is to define is to able to create an item right that's that's able to be observed and measurable for each of these constructs. So, for example, in the motivation, based on the definition that I had earlier, um, I managed. For example, one of the items that may be able to get that is I motivate my team members to accomplish predefined goals. Right. So again, turning that definition of the construct into a observable, measurable item. Is, is, is where this sort of kind of where we are at, at this stage, right? And also one thing I wanna mention here is that as you saw in the motivation definition, there's kind of a three main ideas that were embedded within that. Um, and so you can have multiple items, right? That, that gets at one construct. So for example, like, you know, I could have three, three items that belong to 
the motivation constructs. Again, here the key is that you want to create an item that's just measure, that, that, that you're measuring only one thing at a time. You don't want to have an item that measures you know two or three multiple things because otherwise then you know you, you get confused, right? We, either you or whoever is rating that person gets confused. Is this yeah this person has done this one but has not done this one. So how do I how do I rate how do I rate this right? So it's absolutely critical that you 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 get one item one idea in one item at a time. So I do that for the for the for the leadership. I also do that for the change. So different different areas of competencies is what that example is there. I like participating in projects that incorporate aspects of other engineering disciplines. That was one idea that was represented in different areas of competencies. And then likewise synthesis construct holistic thinking. I believe engineering design is affected by issues related to social and business environments. And so in this case um, you know, we had these bunch of constructs, and then what we did is we 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 managed to create um, 59 different items. Okay, as you can see there, in item 59. And so now, having got these items, we wanted to now um, you know create have have them kind of decide on what sort of rating scale do we want to have. So you may have seen when you were asked to take a survey you know, rate this ability or rate this from scale of one to four, for example, right? Strongly disagree one, strongly agree, uh, sorry, strongly disagree, disagree, agree, strongly agree, right? One, two, three, four, for example, right? Since so you, you know, you rate like one, three or whatever, right? So, so in this work, I selected four point rating uh, and there's kind of a, you know, the literature does kind of go back and forth and, and, and they do say, you know, you should have other even number of rating or odd number of rating. So, you know, four or five, you know, or, or six versus seven, whatever. Uh, but I think the literature is a bit more stronger <laughs> uh, in that it should be an even rating item, right? So that way you do not have a neutral in the middle, right? You always, you either agree or disagree. Because if you have a neutral, there's a study that shows that people don't take time to actually think about those items uh, and then just select neutral all the way through, right? Which is not, not a good thing, right? You really want whoever's taking this to be really serious and so kind of have them kind of decide, you know, do you agree or you disagree or whatever, right? Strongly disagree. So there's a study that's, that says that even number is more reliable and really stable. So in your work, you may want to kind of, you know, consider maybe both, but perhaps start with, with even numbers just to start off with, right? Just to help nudge the people to think, take one stance over the other. And then, of course, you know, these items um, should always be checked. So, you know, the items that were, you know, defined uh, before needs to be checked by other people as well. Like maybe you could have, you could be collaborating with a psychometrician, right, who's, who's expert in, in developing survey items. You could also be kind of sharing these um, items with uh, potential audience, right? Potential participants will be actually taking these surveys, right? So if, if in, my, in my case, you know, I was developing these survey items for our engineering students, I'll share these with these preliminary items with engineering students, have them kind of review over these items and, and ask, you know, does it make sense? You know, is there any unclear sentences or is there a word that doesn't make sense to you? You know, I would ask sort of those questions and then help, help me kind of refine, you know, these items as best as possible. Yeah, question? Yes, we have a question in the chat. Andreas, can you ask your question, please? Um, I, I'm, my, my question is very simple. Do you use anchors and what anchors are you using? Because my concern with the Likert scale is that just what, what does a five or a six or a number mean to me? And does it mean the same for different respondents? Anchor, uh, so, 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 so I, I don't know if, I, if this answers your question. So yeah, so like you know, from one to four, for example, so one would be strongly disagree, two would be uh, disagree, uh, and three would be agree, and four would be strongly strongly agree, right? So 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 each item, the, the, the number of the rating is assigned to a specific you know, qual qualifier. Yeah. Is that the question? Sorry, I, maybe. It, um, yeah, that's the question. If, if you just put numbers in there, or if you have, um, there is difference with it should every, point be anchored should just be the extreme points be anchored um, do you have the anchor on the respondent do you have it on the footnote somewhere on the page um, oh, oh. This influences quite a bit where the respondents come about and the same when you said um, using four or five or a seven Likert scale I'm far more familiar with psychology using a lot of five and if you want to get the attention of people then switch the Likert around um, if it's sometimes a seven sometimes a four that really does get people's attention, but increases the response effort that they need to do. And thereby you're constantly in trade-offs. Sure. 
Yep. And then, of course, uh, I mean, Andrea, I'm, I'm sure, you know, if you do that, you need to make sure you reverse it. Right. It's, especially if you if you switch around from one to seven or one to five. Right. You need to reverse it in your analysis. Um, yeah. So that's fine. Yeah. I mean, so again, yeah, I, you know, different field have different sort of kind of understanding of, you know, whether it should be odd number or even number, um, you know, uh, try, try, try whatever, whatever works. Right. Whatever works best. Um, so, yeah. So, so uh let's see yeah so you know you get checked by your audience uh and then you know make sure that the the the, the um the items make sense uh and then finally you're kind of at a stage where you know you have a pretty good preliminary items ready to go right in your instrument development uh and now it's kind of a time for you to kind of check uh the, the, the reliability and the validity of of the instrument itself right so again i had 59 items uh and you know i would kind of send it out to the potential audience or the people who will be taking so in my case engineering students uh, and you're looking at here um, you know close to you know large sample points right you know hundreds if you know if, if not more uh, to get that sort of solid reliable validity validity uh, and then you go through some sort of this sort of analysis item analysis or export effect analysis where the well at least in the case of export effect analysis you know I would give these 59 items right in in an in entire survey uh, and the goal is to find out whether these 59 items do come up with you know the three three constructs the three main constructs that i have i have started off with before right so you run this sort of factor analysis and hopefully if everything works out you know you would have these sort of three things one for the leadership one for the synthesis and one for the change uh, and it may not right it may not it may come up that you know leadership um, construct can be somehow divided into two separate things, maybe one for leadership and one for leadership styles. The same thing can happen in change and synthesis. But again, this is the, the exploratory factor analysis would then help you determine, you know, how many factors really resides within these 59 items, right? Um, so that's one way of sort of checking for it. Um, but I think, you know, this sort of exploratory factor analysis, I mean, that's obviously getting down into, you know, the nitty gritty details of, you know, conducting a rigorous research, uh, but you know, in, if you're just more of just try to understand, you know, person's innovation skills and and what have you, um, you know, you could you could exclude this step if you want to, right? I mean, this, again, it's just depending on how how much do you really want your skill to be reliable and and valid. Um, so so that so that you know, those would be sort of the analysis that you could potentially take, uh, and then so in terms of the summary wise, right, that the timeline or or the procedure of the entire process would be. As I mentioned, you divide by phase one and phase two, uh, where phase one, you know, you'd start with sort of the qualitative data collection in depth interview. Your product would be the transcripts. You know, you want to determine what to measure, right? Without knowing pre, you know, without having this sort of preconception of what leadership or what innovation is, you go through the analysis procedure, task number two, and then the task number three becomes sort of the pre-development of the items themselves, uh, and then kind of compiling it uh, and then administering it row number four uh, and then row number five would be sort of doing the final sort of checkup of the instruments checking for reliability and validity and, and so on and so forth so so i guess what i want the students and and, and perhaps the faculty who are um, sort of have done have not done sort of this sort of um, outcome sort of cr creation of an instrument that will be able to measure outcome is maybe sort of replicate some of these steps right some of the practices that i've shared with you about conducting interviews and sort of about creating sort of these items and 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 um, you know, instruments uh, to be able to measure an outcome that you're interested in measuring, right? Um, whether that's innovation again, or creativity, or in my case, uh, professional skills. Um, ben, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was wondering um, uh, if it would be helpful. I can, so I did a preliminary interview. I realize I may have used um, two complicated anchors, but I can give an example of how we looked at innovation mindset, for example. Would that be helpful to show? Uh, sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just really briefly. Um, one moment. Um, Do I you have to stop to, sharing. Yeah, yeah. But I just thought um, I might share. So because we, when you talk about innovation and leadership, it can be so. Now, this may not be, um, you know, uh, the anchors. It might be too complicated. But um, you can see the anchors were up here. And this format isn't the greatest. But the, um, the skills we decided around innovation mindset were confidence, doing hard things, personal insight, and a plan, strategic and purpose-driven. But what I'm realizing by what, and the anchors were 
Um, I, I, I changed my mindset about this. I had experience, I excelled. But what I'm realizing is your point about putting things in a statement rather than a just a descriptor would probably be more effective. Would that be fair? I think so, right? Again, the, the creation of these instruments is that for the participants or the, or the person who's taking it to be absolutely, absolutely clear about what is it that we want to measure, right? So if, if a word can do it, then by all means, that's, that's good. You want it simple items, but if typically word, I think is a bit not, not enough, like not sufficient. Yeah. So you want a kind of a sentence or, or yeah, a statement that you know, people can really clearly understand uh, and then be able to uh, you know, rate themselves, right? Um, either self, selfly or by some ex expert who's, who's, who's observing them and rating their own skill, right? Uh, and then also I noticed, uh, Karen, in your case, uh, you had this sort of anchor um, without actual like numbering, right? So change mindset, right. Um, right. like head experience yeah. excelling. So um, you, could, you could certainly say, you know, like, you know, number of people have said, um, you know, excelling, right, in respect to this, you know, percentage of students said, you know, idea generation, excelling, and, and so on and so right. forth. But typically, the, the, the benefit of having a, like a like a type scale in terms of scaling, like a continuous scale, like from one to six, or one to five, or, yeah. or whatever scale that you use, uh, with that sort of sort of in, uh, increments, is that you can do a bit more additional detail analysis later, uh, you know, like correlation analysis or, or, or some, some yeah, I don't know, path analysis or whatever, some additional analysis that you can kind of find additional details about, you know, um, you know that their abilities with, with other aspects, right? Yeah. So, so there, there's a benefit for that too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Any other questions while we're So if you would like to ask it, you, you may. The, the question is by Andreas, why not run confirmatory factor <laughs> analysis? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so yeah, so Andreas, I'm, I'm sure you know. So yeah, so you typically run a, so just for the audience who are not quite familiar with this. So you typically initially run a exportive factor analysis to see how the factors come up, right? And then you do another set of analysis with a new, group of data, a new people data, right? So not the, not the one that you use for export effect analysis, but a new group of people uh, to confirm your factors, right? So, so, you know, to see if the factors do actually come up, right? So that's, that's more to do with validation, right? So you could potentially do an export effect analysis with students at Iowa State University to, to obtain the factors related to leadership skills, for example. And then you could potentially do, do another data collection at another similar institution like Midwestern University from another institution with a similar student body, what have you, to confirm the factors, right? And if there is confirmation, the factors, you know, come up, come up pretty similarly and what have you, then, you know, you kind of get a feel of confidence that, you know, your, your, your factors are pretty stable uh, and, and good. But of course, you still need to continue. This is a kind of a long-term validation procedure, right? You can't just, uh, but then if the factors do not come up, uh, you know, clearly like, so, you know, at Iowa State, we had three factors, but it, at another university came up with four factors or whatever, then of course, that's the kind of time where you need to kind of look into these factors and, and, and kind of can decide, okay, is what, why is there another factor here? What does the literature say about this? Uh, can this sort of additional factor be confirmed by the interview participants? Uh, those are who are experts. So those, there's some additional um, analysis and work that would then go on. And of course, that's all part of the validation of the instrument, right? Uh, which would continue to increase the increase that aspect. So yeah, I mean, good question. Yeah, I mean, you, you certainly want to do CFA as well um, to further confirm the findings. Well, Benjamin, you also, you started to create them with an idea in the back of your mind how they linked together. You created them from the qualitative interviews with the idea, this is the measures that go to motivation. Then mm -hmm. I think you want to check first confirmatory if that model that you had in mind is fitting instead of just going on a fishing expedition um, with regard to which of these items um, are hanging together with what other items. So I think they, they, I, I really do strongly believe that the confirmatory um, is the right approach um, even in the qualitative um, developing new measures and that the exploratory um, is um, uh, hitching on, uh, you're more likely to hitch on whatever is in your data and it might either rather distract you from finding the structure you're looking for because you kind of throw the structure that made you create these measures overboard by analyzing just the data with exploratory data analysis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's an important point too, right? So it depends on whether your work is exploratory, um, whether you have a framework that you're starting off with. So, so or, or not, right? So your qualitative work did create a framework. That's what you so nicely showed that you came up with motivation matters, the other matters. And then I have sub points underneath that I'm actually then trying to capture motivation with, correct? That's right. That's right. Uh, yes. So we had items under motivation should hang together. And I think I, I would say like, this is the starting point. To, to, and if it doesn't hang together, then you can start doing exploring. But um, why do fishing in general, when you, you have a, a starting point with a frame that you created very meticulously with your qualitative data? I'll leave it at that. But again, yeah, yeah. not just different philosophy, but I, I think yeah. there is some strong methodological approach that would point into the um, um, dangers of exploratory data analysis in this and um, emphasizing confirmatory as the starting point because of the theory or the qualitative data that guided you into this. And you might have a smaller one, but especially I know people with have a lot of items. Um, then the exploratory um, leads to uh, configurations, but they are not really helpful configurations. You've got to start with at least a roadmap. Sure, yeah. Okay, uh, so, um, yeah, so I guess, um, so let's just coming back to my, let me come back to my presentation slide here. Um, yeah, thanks for the commentary, Ben. I think it was good to just talk about the ground. I have a, an example, but I appreciate your time. Yeah, no, no, yeah, of course. Uh, and then thanks, thanks for all the questions. Um, uh, and then, yeah, actually, <laughs> that was that was my uh, my my last slide. Um, questions. Um, yeah, thank you, thanks for your uh, for your for your attention. Yeah, and then yeah, if there's any other additional questions, I'll be happy to happy to answer it. Yeah. Great. So, do you want to close? Yeah, there we go. Uh, yeah. So I have one more question, and it's a, it's a theory driven question, and I think it's good. I think actually what you're doing is really important because I think what you're doing is um, asking is leadership contextualized to the specific setting, in this case, engineers and how exactly. they do it. Because we do have a lot of leadership literature and a lot of um, stuff out there. And I would be very interested have you found now when you compared what you did to what is the general leadership literature? Um, what were the, um, the, where does it deviate? Where did the digging into the context really uh, help or surprise you in, in, in findings? Yeah, so I think the surprise was this ability, uh, the, the key kind of the, you know, when we talk about leadership, so you're, you're, you're asking more about the actual context of the study uh, than actual procedure. But when I, when I dig further into this, um, at least, you know, my understanding of the literature, I think the synthesized ability uh, was really critically mentioned by the participants that we interviewed, right? The ability to, so it's not only about technical abilities. I mean, that's obviously kind of given that, that you're expected from engineers, but this ability to synthesize sort of other aspects, right? This sort of, you know, business, the politicals, um, the, the uh, what, what other things, uh, but, but, you know, this sort of like holistic thinking mindset is as critical uh, as, you know, technical com competency as well. So that is also considered as, you know, sort of aspect of leadership uh, was kind of the kind of key differences that I found, and you're right, from, from this sort of context of engineers, right, from these uh, 20, 23 expert engineers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Annie, I'm curious about your assessment. Um, I wonder if you might talk about, uh, you know, your work in doing assessments with students and as it relates to the information that, that Ben brought. Well, uh, so, you know, the method is the same. Uh, Ben's method is much more scientifically based because he is focusing on a deeper research. We are doing analysis and we have to do many of these to get to where Ben is. The methodology is the same. Um, you basically have to go through these steps and the, our verification is, uh, I am not involved in that, as I mentioned, because I, I read all the reflections of my students and I, by reading a reflection that is anonymous, I can so exactly who is writing it. So I step back and we have a first group that codes it. Then they go and they verify it. The second group comes in. And sometimes we actually have to go to the third group. And believe it or not, sometimes we bring a student group. Because as a graduate students and faculty, we, we see things differently. 
um, I want to ask a question which is interesting, which in the in both of these scales that you looked at, Benjamin, it, se it seems that technical skills is one out of seven, <laughs> which is very interesting because again, it emphasizes that university type of thinking and the education we do is based on st status. Innovation is not based on status, right? It's based on dimensions that are not necessarily measured in the status configuration. Yeah, so I think, yeah, I, I, I don't quite recall. So one of the ways to identify which of these, um, you know, items or, or abilities are critical aspect, uh, is to look at actually, you know, simply the mean, right? The, the mean of, of, of those ratings. Uh, and, and I can't quite, I don't recall like, you know, what the rating for, for the technical mm -hmm. competency is versus all these others. But certainly, yes, uh, you know, these other abilities beyond the technical ones were also found to be critical aspects. So, mm -hmm. so I think, yeah, I think in terms of, you know, kind of educating our students from, from the side of edu engineering education, um, we should be no, 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 I'm not saying that don't focus on you know making sure that students have these technical abilities, but also have, provide opportunities uh, for students to develop these other abilities that have been found at least by this group of people mm -hmm. um, joining their engineering education career it would be would be would be our role uh, as an educator. Thank you. Uh, anecdotally, um, so 57 percent of our 123 innovation fellows are engineering students. And of that, 57%, um, um, I would say that, um, gosh, probably at least a half of that 57% are aerospace engineering students. And what That's is good. intriguing, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I get like an aerospace engineer at least two a week. And so um, what's happening, what's interesting to me is the difference between the, um, this is true with actually business students and engineering students. It is not true like the, uh, for any other college. In again, anecdotally, the business and engineering students know what they're missing. They know what they have. They seem very aware that they have tech, technical competency and where they're lacking and where they're lacking behavioral capacity and what they have and what they're missing. Mm. They, they are clearly, it's almost, um, uh, they can even identify what those things are. Uh, for the students in the other majors, which might be more um, experiential majors, less um, uh, maybe technically driven, I'm not sure. Those students seem to have a much more difficult time. The students from those colleges identifying, not only identifying um, what they're missing, um, but even uh, differentiating the categories or the uh, of what they're missing, you know, um, even uh, defining a process to identify what they're missing. So that's a, just a unique observation in these last two years working with these students uh, as far as innovation is related. So I just want to kind of um, you made me made me think about something, Karen. So just coming kind of kind of close a loop on my presentation here is that is that I think it's important, and, and maybe this does kind of get to the Andrea's comment as well. It's about, you know, how do we define innovation, right? The innovation that I define will be different from the innovation that you define, different from what mm -hmm. Mani defined, Andrea's defined, and Neil defined, right? So I think it might be important that, that we do go back to the, you know, perhaps existing literature on how innovation is defined Right, and then you know use that as potential kind of the framework, the theory that's behind, um, behind. So in my case, remember I explored what leadership is from these individuals working in the field. Mm -hmm. But if we are interested in creating an innovation skill, I'm, I'm sure there's already out there. But you know, if you're really interested in kind of creating a new innovation skill that's more appropriate for our Iowa State University based on the programs that we provide, we may need to kind of go back to the literature of innovation, start off there, and then convert those into these sort of measurable, observable items, right? Create these items. And then uh, perhaps, you know, do confirmatory factor analysis to see 
if the if the items that we create do align with you know sort of this sort of innovation theory and and the components of innovations right yeah. so so i think that I could have, also be a potential approach as well yeah so i have 30 separate uh, um 24 hour and a half interviews and then an additional um at least six recorded interviews of innovators defining what it means for them and what it means in the industry um but uh, so that's been interesting, um, but some things are consistently the same, but again, they're qualities. So uh, this just, because one of the problems, if you look at the literature on innovation is it is not well-defined and it's not really well-defined or aligned with a specific audience, you know, attached to a specific group and um, specifically attached to specific students from a specific group. So uh, it, it's been a real challenge. So I went out and interviewed people individually. What qualities do you find? But I did it in a very unscientific manner and then um, pulled together the qualities in an order that made sense to me aligned by those constructs. Which I'm happy to continue the conversation here because um, clearly the students, as you heard the interviewed Gabe and um, Ryan Hurley earlier, they are clearly finding the experience of innovating and creating and advancing industry, collaborating, building teams, uh, valuable. But how do we quantify what, what they're finding valuable? So that's where I need to be more specific. I wanted to mention something. Um, some of the most important thing it was amazing. So many comes. Some of the thing that got my attention is how many people you have from Aero compared to other engineering, and it has been years of work by the Aero department. Mm -hmm. The only department in engineering that has a lab called Make to Innovate. Right. The first department in engineering that actually hires Benjamin, the first engineering education PhD that is needed in every department and the college, right? So there, historically, this department has been very uh, progressive in that sense and open-minded, right? And it comes with lots of things. Even I was the head of the SSOL, System Operation Lab, which is a NASA, um, you know, blessed thing that NASA suggested that. And that one was in aerospace. And if you really look at the, the space grant is at aerospace, right? People from other departments go there. So it's an interesting thing that years of real good vision has resulted in exactly what you're seeing. Yeah, now, manifestable across the board. My best leaders are my aerospace engineers. Consistently, uh, aerospace and industrial. Yes. Are uh, uh, out of all of them. And uh, I mean, it is, and, and it's a radical, um, I, I would say in terms of project management, um, the one thing that they struggle with is a couple things, discomfort, um, capacity to tolerate discomfort, uh, capacity to um, identify specific skills and abilities and other team members that are not technical, and That's then nice. leverage and allocate um, activities aligned with those skills and abilities. So, um, but uh, heads and shoulders in terms of project management, um, understanding what progress is, you know, defining progress, um, translating progress into clear, def clearly defined metrics. I mean, it's uncanny. I would like, we're two minutes from the hour. I know I have a meeting at three. I know I have to go, but I would like to continue the conversation because we are reporting to, the, to Princeton um, about uh, the progress of our people. I also report to the university. You know, Andreas, you're trying to get your arms around what this means for business. You may have models. I, um, if anyone's interested in continuing this discussion, I would be very interested. So if you want to reach out to me or Kimberly via email, that would be great. So. Uh, uh, so I would be interested, but I want to make sure it goes back to my talk. Um, not under, not dealing with uncertainty and difficulty is planned into the in our curriculum. Instead yeah. of celebrating mistakes and learning from them, we make a taboo out of mistakes. 
Yeah. Whereas the reality is learning is starts from mistakes. So that's why I, I follow the doing and cycle. That's the, your learning and your everything starts with felt difficulty and what you do with it from there. We have no training what to do, except we just have to say shape up and get better grade on the next class, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I'm Thank going you, to I'm going to head out. Um, please go ahead and finish, Kimberly. Uh, I'm just going to head off to a meeting. Thank you. Thank you. I also have to leave. Thank you. I also have a three o'clock. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you. So I don't know how many people are here. If there's any questions, I have a question. My question is, I go through all these conferences and papers and they all have quantitative and I do, I, I do quantitative analysis and compared to what you said, mine is like baby steps. So I wonder, starting from Cuba on, right, who was a faculty of Iowa State, right, the quantitative analysis methodology, Lincoln and Cuba were faculty, Cuba was faculty of Iowa State in the education department. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't know that. Oh. So interestingly enough, I wonder how do you evaluate when you see a paper? How do you evaluate how well and how many cycles they have gone through? Do, they, do you report those or those are something that is accepted? Uh, so, so you mean when I, when I get asked to review the paper? Yes, and they, they have a, a qualitative analysis. And mm -hmm. you know, I wonder how many of these constructive cycle and redefining and reframing they've gone through. Oh, okay. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, in terms of reviewing a qualitative paper, um, yeah, I would, I mean, I would definitely try to understand, you know, I mean, I would, I would definitely look for the things, right? Like, you know, do they have uh, the, you know, the methodological framework? Do they have, do they use the theoretical framework? Um, see, do, they, do, they, do they go through the sort of the rigors of the analysis procedure and also, um, you know, do they talk to other people like, you know, because with the analysis, right, qualitative analysis, you can't just be on, in your own bubbles, uh, you, you need to be able to kind of, you know, connect with others and also refer back to the existing literature. Uh, and also, you know, how is it, is the findings like transferable or is it just really oh, only good. based on one context? Um, so th there will be like the host of things that I would, I would look at uh, to see the, the rigor of the, of the work. Um, but yeah, just, you know, just, just see how much sort of these sort of steps that they've taken. And then of course, you know, based on Lincoln and Guba, uh, you know, their, their work on how to effectively um, assess the quality paper. That, that's how I would do it. Thank you. Um, and then also what, how do they expand the literature, right? So, oh. um, in terms of if they used existing theory, do their work allow us to expand on that literature? Does it does it build on it? Does it confirm the theory? And then also does it add additional theory or findings into it? So those are the sort of the you know the bigger picture also that I would ask myself as well. So yeah, I mean you know the, as you know, uh, money qualitative research is is fun, can All be right. very ambiguous, uh, but have to be very persistent. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This is such an interesting conversation as um, a lowly staff person. I feel like I've learned a lot. Um, so I really appreciate getting to sit in and, and listen, not just to the presentation, but the questions that were posed today. Um, so I really do appreciate uh, everybody who showed up. Very good. Yeah, well, yeah thank you for um, attending my session. I appreciate your time very much. Yes. Uh, I, I know that we will plan to put this up on our website, um, it's kind of one of our winter break projects. And I didn't know, Dr. Ahn, if you wouldn't mind, I can email you so you have my um, email address, but if we could share the PowerPoint with that as well. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll do that. But if I don't do it, just feel free to send me an email. I'll, I'll, I'll try to do it right away. Yeah. Yeah. After this. Call. Benjamin, this is uh, Neil. <clears throat> as a uh, full career of innovation and innovators, I just like to uh, I think you, what you're embarking on can be really truly impactful. Uh, just a couple of thoughts, and I'd be happy to share a lot more. Have any kind of discussion you want to have, but I would be very careful with using the term change management. Hmm. I mean, in my career at the Skunk Works, one of the things we found out was, you know, there are people 
that are just not wired for change or they're they're mm -hmm. wired their desirement is in to have a minimum amount of change mm. so they would eventually kind of go away or we would move them elsewhere into other places in lockheed because they were not at home in that kind of environment where you were really set up the organizational construct to encourage motivate and allow acquisition and that's a different some while the leadership characteristics may look the same it's a different approach mm. uh, because it really relies on significant competence of the workforce individuals yet it also relies on each one of those individuals ability to work as a team mm. and so you those are two spectrums that i don't know how you measure exactly but they are critical elements of getting the job done. So when you work in an environment that is, as you all know, there are any number of uh, graphics and, and things like Moore's Law that show the, how technology development is dramatically accelerating in our time over the, over the last 50 years, particularly, uh, and accelerating something on the scale of a Moore's Law kind of thing. Uh, technology adoption while also accelerating, is not being adopted at near the same pace. So another thing you learn in industry, particularly at the leading edge like the Skunk Works is, routinely, we would develop a capability or I'll say an innovation, usually technology, but could be integration, could be manufacturing, other kinds of uh, innovation that would, while ready for use, wouldn't be adopted by customers the market and the environment for 10 years, you know, mm. many times a decade behind, even in leading edge engineering like aerospace, the adoption rate is much lower. Mm. And those are kinds of things that your synergy element should be thinking through and, and trying to look at, I would, I would think. So I'm just, a, just a note to be careful with change management. Uh, may think of terms like leverage change. Mm. How does an individual or group leverage change? You know, change means opportunity to some. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the far right of the spectrum, it means, oh my God, we got to stop now <laughs> at the other end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you probably had all these discussions before, but it just comes out that I think those three elements, as I looked at them and began to digest them and how you set it up, I think you've got really an excellent baseline with which to think through the construct, but there are some potential uh, hand grenades in there sure. uh, uh, that are just probably useful to be aware of. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, it could, yeah, it could go off alarm yeah. bells, right? <laughs> since, since I have Neil and Benjamin here, the, it's very interesting that there is a course called Creative thinking. I don't know if you know, there is a, yeah. they did this creative thing and students were saying, oh my God, this is such an amazing course because in my engineering classes, I have critical thinking and now this is creative. So I disagree. <laughs> I actually think engineering classes do not have critical thinking. You know, unless yeah. the teacher is aware of this, right? And that is the problem. The problem is we don't allow them to question us. Critical thinking starts with sometimes very stupid question, right? And it's a very interesting thing that students believe they learn critical thinking in engineering. Whereas the people like Barry Stein showed that it's absolutely not true unless the faculty actively identifies an underst show understanding, they won't. So that is one. What do you think? Yeah, because Neil does <clears throat> works with these very critical and creative people. I, I'm not sure how I did uh, define the characteristic, but I I lean more towards fundamental thinking. Um, I was on the engineering advisory council or board, whatever we called it, for four years. It's been a while, but one of the things that uh, we uh, many of us from industry tried to communicate were that we found students, particularly from other universities, not Iowa State, you know, that would come very well equipped uh, with a toolbox, you know, let's, you know, with algorithms, tools, 
particularly computer-based, that they could go through and, and work a problem and solve it and, and uh, be successful. But that really uh, was a detriment, it turns out, to innovation. Because in the worst case, they fundamentally didn't know when they had an answer, they didn't have the fundamental underpinning to think through it and go, well, that's four decimal points off. That can't be. <laughs> I'm, I'm, this is an exaggeration. I know of, what you mean. But, but it's, so it's kind of a back to basics element that's critically important here. And whether you call it creative thinking or critical thinking, uh, I, I think you may be on exactly the right path to really think through that. What are the terms and what do they really mean? And what are the, what is the best way to incorporate those thoughts, uh, particularly in an undergraduate uh, education? That's and true. So I think you're, you're right on the money to stir that pot and think about that. And, and how does it work? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if that helps or not. But that's oh, that helps. Thank you. Thank you. Very wonderful. Um, ben, this was brilliant. Made me think many, many times and question what I do constantly, which I need. Important. Yeah, no, thank, thank you for your questions, Mani thank and you. Neil. Yeah. Cheers. So keep on keeping on. Go close. Exactly. Oh, that's so interesting. I do. I use that as many times my signature of every message. Keep on keeping on. I got it from uh, Herman you know, Blake, I don't know if you remember who Herman Blake was. He was a faculty here. So I said, I'm going to use it. He said, go ahead. I love keep on keeping on. He may have been gone when I graduated. <laughs> no, Herman, right. Herman Blake, Herman Blake uh, was one of the civil rights leaders that became a faculty. Oh, great. In, in sociology. And he was here for a while. And I, I had the luck to work both with him and his wife. Well, Thomas Edison would clearly be... Uh clapping when he heard that although i don't think he was ever quoted as said saying keeping on keep on keeping on that's clearly his focus on innovation oh, yeah. was i'm just going to keep trying it until i get it right maybe a thousand <laughs> time will work that's right because i i know all the things that doesn't work so I'm, i should be very close to the answer right? <laughs> exactly yeah well that Thank goes you. back to the conversation about uh continuing through um being uncomfortable just keep on oh, keeping yeah. on oh exactly it's you know I, it's, so persistence is clearly, you know, another one of those characteristics you could be looking for, but it, but it can't be persistence in plugging numbers into an algorithm. It's got to yes. be you know, back to this critical or creative thinking thought that you had earlier. So, you know, I'm sorry to keep you, but I, in my freshman class, my motto is let's be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm. Now that's, um, uh, you know, that's if we had a way to measure that at the Skunk Works, that would clearly affect the hiring process for sure, because there's any number of ways to try to look at that. And a lot of times you just can't see how people are going to deal with mm -hmm. uh, living in a really uh, not only environment that has a lot of uncertainty, but a, a, an environment where you're expected to produce or contribute to the product that you have to, you know, it's obviously in industry it comes down to a dollar sign and you got to sustain yourself so so those two things kind of collide in a number of interesting ways as you're well aware sorry I'm, it's, uh, it's interesting that kimberly also brought the same you know kimberly do you know whose motto it is be comfortable with being uncomfortable no marines marines motto is uh, absolutely big, uh, isn't that interesting that is very interesting i mean it should be all of our mottos honestly but yeah i didn't know that yeah, and if you so if you really want to get into some interesting reading and get into John Boyd's, uh, he didn't really write a book, but he wrote a lot of uh, uh, presentations. And you know, he is the premier military strategist in the U.S. in the la in the last half of the 20th century, 1950 and on. And and his uh, you'll hear him say, or he will espouse ideas exactly like that. Uh, longer time. In fact, one of my favorites, uh, being a fighter pilot, is he is he would say that yeah, you're much better responding to a situation immediately and violently rather than waiting for a well thought out and perfectly executed response. Hmm. You know, so again, another spectrum to think through. 
Yes. Thank you. I, I'm going to be thinking about you. that one. <laughs> it's wonderful. Well, at, as I said, it applies to being a fighter pilot. It may not apply that <laughs> broadly elsewhere, but something to think about. Yeah, it's just so interesting how it depends on your discipline. As somebody who was from College of LAS, that is very like, okay, what are you talking about? But maybe that's yeah. the discomfort I need to sit in. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So thank you all. Thank you, everyone. And uh, Kimberly, you you have the control of this session, right? I do, yes. Thank so I think when I end it, it's going to end for all of us. So, but yes. thank you all. I, I hope have you a great have a wonderful day. Friday, and uh, we'll thank talk you. soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, and regards from the warm sunshine of Southern California. Oh, I'm jealous. <laughs> yes.